Hello and welcome to this conversation. My name is Noel Snyder and I'm a program manager at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. And I'm delighted to have as my conversation partner today, Dr. Corrine Mogg. Dr. Mogg is the director of the H. Henry Meter Center for Calvin Studies at Calvin University. She's also a professor of history here at Calvin University and teaches at Calvin Theological Seminary. She is the author of many books, including her most recent book, Worshiping with the Reformers, published by IVP Academic. And that is the subject of our conversation today. Corrine, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here. Yeah, so I wondered if we could start with you telling us a little bit about the book. What, where did it come from? What were some of your motivations and hopes with it? So, um, I am a historian, a social historian of the Reformation, and a lot of my previous research and writing has been on other themes, I'd say, um, on the training of pastors in the Reformation, on church and state issues in the Reformation, uh, a lot of work on Geneva. Um, I did uh, look at the worship in Geneva uh, with John Calvin for a book that we actually published with Erdman's, a uh, book of primary sources, but this was a little different. Uh, for this book, I was actually approached by David McNutt, who's one of the editors at IVP. And he approached me and said, well, you see, we have this series. It's called the Reformation Commentary on Scripture series. And those are volumes that go through the Bible book by book and provide extracts from the various reformers' own commentaries. And then, David said, we have a companion volume series, which is there to help maybe general readers, pastors, interested people, learn more about different aspects of the Reformation. And David approached me and said, I'd be really interested in having you, Karine, write this book on worshiping with the Reformers. And I thought that was an interesting idea. I thought about it a while, and I said I would do it so long as it was clear that I was going to be interested primarily in the practice of worship. So there's some theology in it, but a lot of it is focused really clearly on practice. And what was it like to be someone in the 16th century going to church, attending the sacraments, being part of that worshiping community? What was that actually like? And that was the, the, the start of that project. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's one of the things I love the most about the book is it helps you kind of get a feel uh, for what it was like. I, it, it's been out for uh, the better part of a year now, and by the time that uh, many of our viewers will see this, it will be out for uh, almost an entire year. Yep. I'm wondering if you have heard uh, any, any feedback. What observations are people making about the book? Uh, my sense is that people are enjoying the read because it is very accessible. Um, it is done in a way to make the experience of worship come alive for people. And I did so deliberately. So what I did was I organized the book by chapters covering each different aspect of worship that I could think of. And it's mostly public worship. So going to church, being at church, preaching, praying, baptism, the Lord's Supper, arts and music, worship in the home. So each of these chapters then is done comparatively by confessional group. So what were the Lutherans doing? The Catholics, the Reformed, the Anabaptists, the Anglicans. I made them into a separate category. But then I introduced each chapter with these vignettes, with these accounts of first-person, essentially narratives, experiences of what was it like to be someone at worship in these circumstances in the 16th century. And readers so far have really told me that they found those stories mm -hmm. so helpful. Really, in, yeah, in, in, in bringing to life the experience of people whom you may not hear about otherwise, like women, for instance, or folks who don't you know, write big theological tomes, but they're in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's one of the things that I personally enjoyed uh, mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. from the book was this uh, ability to have these vignettes, what I think what I have would call tidbits, these little interesting uh, pieces of uh, what the average worshiper would have experienced. For instance, I had never heard of this practice of burying the dead underneath church floors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was uh, uh, one way that all of a sudden, wow, when you consider that as a feature of public life, of public worship, mm -hmm. um, it really makes things come alive in a, in a different way from what you would typically find in a, in a book about Reformation era theology and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
I, I wonder if there are other uh, tidbits, vignettes that you would want to share just as an example of Absolutely. what it was like. I mean, I think what comes through in these vignettes is how central the worship experience was to Christians in the 16th century. In other words, they may not always have fully grasped the theology, right? They may not have been able to explain to you the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation, but they definitely understood the rituals and cared about those rituals. Mm -hmm. And if those rituals changed, they were not happy. And they noticed, right? And, and so there's, there's cases, for instance, the one my family particularly enjoyed, because they read the book too, mm -hmm. was um, the story of this, this man who has a baby. He wants to have this baby baptized in Brandenburg. And Brandenburg is in Germany, and it had been first Catholic, then Lutheran for a good number of years, and then Reformed. But when it became Reformed, that was really the will of the prince. He wanted the community to be Reformed. It wasn't like the population thought, oh yeah, that's what we really want. So this father turns up for baptism, and the pastor's there, and it's a Reformed pastor because the government has appointed the pastors, and he's Reformed. But the father is Lutheran and wants a Lutheran baptism for his baby girl. And especially, he wants to make sure that the right of exorcism is included, where the power of the devil is removed from the child by a special anointing in prayer. And in order to ensure that this happens, this father, who happened to be a butcher, brings along his cleaver. All right, so you just imagine the scene, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, this father is so keen to ensure what he thinks of as a real baptism, mm -hmm. that he will bring a weapon in to enforce it. And you would just imagine the Reformed pastor standing there thinking, now what do I do? Because Reformed baptisms did not mm -hmm. involve exorcism. <laughs> right, right. Uh, one of the things I loved about the book was there are ways that it got me thinking about what similar issues may be carried yeah. on yeah. from Reformation era that w with things like uh, what's the proper way to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. and um, how to uh, properly pray and, and um, what prayers look like in public worship and in private life and all of that. But then there are some things that are so different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, one thing you mentioned uh, just uh, now it's sort of in passing is that the pastor would have been um, appointed by yeah. the local civic authorities. Yep. And you have the whole chapter at the beginning of the book about uh, going to church. And it yep. was the responsibility of the civic authority to ensure that people were in church, not just every Sunday, but throughout the week as well. Yes. So uh, I wonder when you think about the things that are maybe the same that we experience, but also some of the things that are different uh, yep. from what we would experience uh, in modern times uh, for worship. How do you think the book can help us think about some of those things that are the same and some of those things that are different? I, I think that's a very good question. I mean, part of it is difficult because a North American context in particular, there's a very strong sense of separation. There's the government here and there's a the church there and there's not a lot of overlap, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Europe, in fact, still in some places, there's more of a state church mentality. That was the, true in Switzerland until very recently, true in some of the German lands in Scandinavia. They'd be more comfortable with this kind of process. But you're right that for a North American audience, it feels very strange, right? The idea that the government is appointing the clergy, paying the clergy salaries, making rules about who needs to be in church, everybody, um, <laughs> and what they need to be doing while they're there. I found that fascinating, and I found it fascinating that it didn't matter if you were in a Catholic place or Lutheran or Anglican or Reformed they had the same rules. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to be in church on Sunday. They need to be there on time. They need to be reverent and quiet and listening, and they may not leave early, okay? Mm -hmm. No chit-chatting, no dashing out as soon as the sermon is done, okay? The priorities were the same across the board, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. But there are clear also places in which what you see in the 16th century maybe helps explain some of the ongoing mm -hmm. issues we have today. Mm -hmm. And some I found really interesting. So for instance, where I go to church here in Grand Rapids, when I came, I found, it very dis I found two things very disconcerting. I found it very disconcerting that in this Christian Reformed Church, we very rarely, like maybe two or three times a year, say the Lord's Prayer during worship, mm -hmm. like almost never. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a Protestant tradition in Canada where the Lord's Prayer was said every Sunday. It was just like part of the service. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of scratching my head thinking, 
Why? Right? But then if you look into the practice of worship in Geneva, and especially what Calvin was saying, there was a worry that too much recitation of the Lord's Prayer would be superstitious and too Catholic. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. so hence the difference. That was one. Mm -hmm. The other I really noticed was that in the church where I started attending, um, the organ prelude seemed to be the pretext for conversation. Like it was time to check in on your neighbor and say hi and converse and so on. When I grew up in, in Canada, the, the, the organ prelude, like when the organist started playing, that was the start of worship. Hmm. And you'd better be quiet and reverent and start your praying and thinking about holy things. It was not a time for conversation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I could not understand this. It seemed kind of rude. And I was like, why? Well, it turns out that, uh, especially in the Netherlands, where, of course, the Christian Reformed Church has its roots, um, worship what took place a cappella, in terms of a cappella singing, right? There was no organ accompaniment. Mm -hmm. Organs were in the churches in the Netherlands, but they were city organs, paid for by the city authorities, and the organist was paid by the city authorities. And the compromise they worked out in the Dutch church was that the organist would pray a prelude and a postlude, before and after, paid for by the city, <laughs> but that was not worship, that was paid for by the city. And worship was exactly when the pastor comes into the pulpit, and that's when you start. Hmm. And now I understand. Right. <laughs> it's like, I know where this is coming from. Yeah. So it made much more sense to me at that point. Right. Wow. So interesting. And there were so many other things like that in the book that I mm -hmm. found that if you have a little bit of historical context yep. and perspective, all of a sudden it, it makes you, I think, able to think about our own practice um, mm -hmm. nowadays, at least in a different light. And one of the things that I started to think about a lot when I was reading the book was that um, no matter whether it's the same issue or a different issue mm -hmm. as you can find uh, being discussed, there is always, it seems like in every age, this ongoing process of negotiation, yes. of some yep. conflict sometimes, yep. uh, but uh, what is right, what is proper, how to best uh, carry on the worship of the church. Yep. And uh, it almost in a way made me feel a little bit more free yes. uh, to to take part in that um, context yeah. of negotiation and conflict sometimes because you can see that they're doing it also in the Reformation area. It's not set in stone. Uh, it's an ongoing process of discernment. Absolutely. And I think that's very true. And you can see that in different ways um, in terms of different ways of celebrating the Lord's Supper, right? Mm -hmm. Are we going to have leavened bread or unleavened bread? Are we going to have people come forward? Are we going to have people stay in their places? Uh, you know, the whole process is, is a little bit up for grabs. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in Geneva, one of the causes of controversy in the first years of the Reformation was over what kind of bread are we going to use? <laughs> mm -hmm. And it seems like a silly thing to fight about, but they hadn't sort of figured that out yet, right? Mm -hmm. Unleavened bread seemed too Catholic. Ordinary bread seemed not holy enough. You know, there's mm -hmm. just a whole lot of different understanding as to what's going on here. Mm -hmm. So you can see that, yes, the, the, there are a lot of debates. There's a lot of stuff that's not decided. And um, the borderlines between confessional groups are fairly fluid, mm -hmm. right? So people are aware of what other people are doing. And there's some sort of sense of, yeah, we've got to figure our own story out because we don't want to be too much like those other people with whom we are not in agreement. So mm -hmm. it's a complicated process. It's within the community, but it's also this particular faith community kind of negotiating its place in the light of these other faith communities round about that see things a bit differently. Mm -hmm. Right. Was there anything in the writing of this or the research mm -hmm. that went into it that surprised you? Things that turned out maybe differently than you expected. You know, I found that really interesting. Um, the one I was really interested about, which I didn't know as much about when I started, was some of the aspects of worship at home and what worship at home might look like in this time period. And particularly, um, the end of the book focuses really on the most narrow point, which is worship around the sick bed or even the death bed, right? Mm -hmm. What are the options here? And um, I knew from my own experience that in certain communities, um, there are very clear rituals that happen, right? If you're Catholic, there are last rites, right? Things that happen around the deathbed of someone. Uh, traditionally, that would involve the priest coming and an anointing and a last communion and a last confession and absolution. There's all these steps, right? And the Lutherans take up something very similar. The Anglicans have something very similar. But I knew that the Reformed were not 
as comfortable with that. And particularly that there was a lot of unease over having communion outside of a church setting. And in fact, there's one of the synods in the Netherlands that says very firmly, we are not going to have communion outside of church, that that's not okay. And in fact, more traditional uh, reformed communities today still do not allow for communion outside of the church building with the elders and the whole you know, ritual in place. Mm -hmm. What I found really interesting and hadn't realized is that Calvin actually writes very movingly about the need to bring communion to the sick at home if they cannot come to church and they are in you know, fairly severe need of spiritual comfort, mm -hmm. that that should be something. We should not withhold that from them. And I found that very comforting because, mm -hmm. I mean, to my mind, it's one of the most important things you can do as a community is gather around the bed of someone who is sick or dying mm -hmm. and bring them that spiritual comfort. So I was enormously encouraged mm -hmm. at finding this link that said, uh, actually, within the Reformed community in France, in Geneva, they are articulating ways to make this happen mm -hmm. in creative ways. And I thought that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like what you said there also of uh, the finding ways to make it happen because yep. their theology is it really is the act of the whole church yep. and elders and pastors and congregations should be present. Mm -hmm. So um, in, rather than getting locked in this either or, yep. they actually find a way then to bring the congregation and the elders and the pastor all together in the space of the, of the sick, which yep. as you said, it's a very moving thing to, to witness. And to, to be part to, of, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, I wonder, um, one of the things that I really appreciated as well uh, that you mentioned earlier is that you included the Catholic perspective. Yes. Uh, when you read a book called Worshiping with the Reformers, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I don't think I expected to find as much of a emphasis on what were the Catholics doing at yeah. this time yep. when the Reformation traditions were all being negotiated and, and mm -hmm. starting up. And why do you think that it's important uh, to include uh, the Catholic perspective in a book like this? Well, I think it's vital. I mean, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to do a book about worshiping with the Reformers without having some sense of the broader context out of which the Reformation came, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to think all the leading Reformers, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, had their training in the Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. Luther and Zwingli were both Catholic priests. This is formative for them, right? This is the environment out of which they come. Now, they may reject it, go against it, have disagreements with it, but unless you understand that context, for one thing, you're not going to make sense of the directions at which they go. Mm -hmm. And if it's totally understood oppositionally, as in, well, this is what the reformers did and we don't care about anything else, that doesn't make a lot of sense either. Because the world of the Reformation is, again, a world in which there are Catholics, and in some places, majority Catholic populations. In France, for instance, the Reformed community is very small. It's operating within a Catholic world. So you can't ignore it. That would look very weird. So I think it has to be part of the conversation. I think the Catholics themselves had movements from within that wanted to make changes to their own practices. So to make them the sort of static wall or static reality that you're not really going to consider seemed very peculiar to me and not not accurate. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, what you see a lot of the times is when we talk about uh, aspects of worship, a lot of times it is this negotiating practice between what had been perhaps a Catholic practice and what might be either a re renovated Catholic practice or a Protestant practice reacting to it. Right? Mm -hmm. So you need to have those pieces together. Yeah. So back to this business about burying the dead and where do you bury them? Right. Um, the Catholic tradition had been that being buried in the floor of the church was good and being buried as close as possible to the altar is best, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the holy spot, so you want to be there. And there's a sense in which the Protestants continued that understanding. And that's partly a, a lineage and a family thing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go to church, well, all the Snyders are buried there, right? Your mm -hmm. grandparents are there and so on. And you're almost worshiping within your lineage, within your family history. Mm -hmm. Where you worship, well, that's where your dad and your granddad and so on, they're, they're, they're in the floor, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you become Protestant. Well, that's wonderful. And now another family member dies. Well, do you want to put them away out in the graveyard by themselves? Mm -hmm. That seems very lonely and far away from everyone. And even though you're fully Protestant, you're still operating within that mindset mm -hmm. that says that, at worship, we are together, the living and the dead, the community of the saints, and 
and he needs to be with us in the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's just very helpful to kind of uh, to to think. It, it feels like it roots you more in the in the present moment and what it's like mm -hmm. to not experience things somewhere out here uh, in this abstract realm, but mm -hmm. in a very much a material realm of of how to negotiate these things. One of the things I really appreciated, even in. Uh, the way that you uh, talk about preaching in the book mm -hmm. was you cleared up one of the common misperceptions of uh, Catholics um, not hearing any preaching before yeah. the Reformation um, mm -hmm. in the worship service. And that's just not true, as, mm -hmm. you, as you said. Absolutely. Uh, the, that's one. And the other one that people think is that Catholics never read a Bible. Mm -hmm. And that's not accurate either. There is access to Scripture before the Reformation, not in all languages, not necessarily complete Bibles, but they do have access to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really appreciated mm -hmm. that, found that really helpful. One of the things I uh, wonder if you would uh, spend a moment helping us think about is what sorts of things uh, average worshipers, but also worship leaders, mm -hmm. pastors could learn from this book and mm -hmm. how it might help them in their current practice. Mm -hmm. I think what it really does is, first of all, it helps untangle some of the things we are still dealing with, right? So some of the, the examples I mentioned about what prayers do we say, how do we organize our liturgy, you know, what counts as worship versus the prelude and the postlude kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Those are very basic, but even just understanding where that comes from really mm -hmm. helps. Mm -hmm. um, I think what it can also do is help us be more patient, I think, with one another. You know, when worship wars break out in churches, it gets very difficult very quickly. And sometimes I think church leaders don't understand why community members get so bent out of shape about what music we're singing or, you know, how the service is organized or even where the seating is and so on and so forth. And I think what the book helps you understand is it is a very human reality to be very wedded to the practices of worship. It is, it is heart centered for so many people. Mm -hmm. And it, honestly, when, when, you know, Mrs. Something or other is all upset about what hymns we're talking, we're singing about, mm -hmm. It may not be that she's just a grumpy lady who can't get with the program. It might be very much that what she's trying to express is how heart-centered her practice of worship has been for her all these years and what that means to her mm -hmm. in terms of her sense of herself as a person of faith. Mm -hmm. And so being giving each other more understanding, I think, can be one of the outcomes of this book. Just by seeing you know, how deeply people care about these issues and how they matter to them. Mm -hmm. Now, some of it's really funny. I mean, the whole business about church seating is hilarious, mm -hmm. right? Where mm -hmm. do you sit in church? Right. We still see that, right? <laughs> right? You better not sit in someone else's spot where they've been sitting for 30 years. Uh -huh. <laughs> You'll get the dirty looks and the kind of you don't belong there kind of feeling. Right. Yeah. It's such a funny thing, yeah. right? That people should have a sense of reserved seating mm -hmm. in church. Um, but... There's a whole history to that, and my book will tell you all about it. Yeah, right. And I, uh, that's one of those things that I, I kind of like roll my eyes at. Uh, really? Like people really make a big deal about that? Um, but it, it goes even farther than, is this my seat or not? It's, can I buy this pew or not? Mm -hmm. And reserve it and put my name on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, I mean, for many churches, not so much in my period, but later on, so you get 17th century, 18th, 19th, early 20th century, it was one of the main ways churches raised their budget every year was mm -hmm. pew rentals, right? So and particularly in North America, very common, right? Mm -hmm. Pew rentals, and the, and the more important your pew was, or more prominent it was, the more expensive it was, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there might be free seating at the back, way at the back, or in the gallery or something. Mm -hmm. But that's a way churches fundraised. So yeah, it makes total sense that someone would think this is my pew, I paid for it kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. But something that comes through, I think, clearly in my book is that the social hierarchy, the order of precedence, the sense of who's important in society and who's mm -hmm. not, is not left outside the church doors. Mm -hmm. It marches in with the people. Mm -hmm. And it's present, right? In what order do we line up for communion in Reformation Geneva? That's on social hierarchy. The most important people first. All the men with the most senior man first. And then all the women with the most prominent woman first. Mm -hmm. um, where do you sit in church? Where, where's the best seat? Who mm -hmm. gets it? Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of social hierarchy still present. It doesn't disappear in church. It's not like suddenly you open the church doors and everyone's equal. Mm -hmm. that, that's not the reality. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and that's one of the, actually also a thing that I appreciated about the book. It, it's kind of sad. Um, it mm -hmm. seems to me a direct um, defiance of scriptural teaching yep. uh, about social hierarchy and um, who, how to negotiate that in, in worship and who gets the honor and the, the precedence. But it also, in that way, um, re represents a way that we can avoid uh, nostalgia about yeah. the, the purity of yeah. these uh, movements. Yes. And if we could only just get back to the 16th century or 17th century, then every problem that we experience now would be solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't really work. If you read the book, you can tell it's a little <laughs> bit more uh, quarrelsome and sort of elbows out kind of thing. The other thing that's maybe hard for people to realize is we have a sense of, I don't know, past reverence that in the past people are way more holy and, 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 and Calvin spoke and everyone listened quietly and so on. <laughs> I think worship was quite noisy, right? Mm -hmm. Just audit, in terms of the auditory world, mm -hmm. um, the oral sense, um, there's no Sunday school, okay? Mm -hmm. So everybody's there, including the little kids. Um, in some places they let nursing mothers off because you don't want howling infants all the way through church. But as I said in the book at one point in Perth, in Scotland, they ask families with infants who are bringing infants to baptism not to come except for the baptism because the pastor doesn't want his sermon drowned out by the howling, screaming babies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, that's something you don't think about. I mm -hmm. mean, churches today in many churches, you know, especially if the pastor's speaking, if a baby as much as peeps, the mother's kind of pulling the child out. Yeah. Um, that's not the case in the 16th century. There's dogs running around. There's people sort of chit-chatting when they're not supposed to. And mm -hmm. it's a very lively world. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, there's no, the children are there. You know, it's just, there's a lot of life, living kind of noise going along. And, and for sure, one of the requirements for a pastor, one of the fundamental requirements was to have a good, loud voice. Right? Mm -hmm. You could be as learned as you want, but if you're soft spoken as a pastor, that's not going to get you anywhere. They have no sound systems, right? Yeah. You have to be able to yell, basically, to mm -hmm. make yourself heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a very real concern then. Mm -hmm. And it would make sense that they would have that concern about the screaming babies and all the other noise. And uh, one of the things that made me smile was uh, when you mentioned uh, people mumbling during the sermon because they're doing their own little devotionals, mm -hmm. which was a practice from the Catholic tradition that some people had carried on. And, yep. and then the unhappiness about that and mm -hmm. trying to stop people from doing it. And yep. And, and even in Catholic churches, problems with crowd surges, right? When they bring out icons or holy relics and folks surge forward, mm -hmm. you know, the exact same thing has just happened at that concert in the States, right? Mm -hmm. There's crowd surge problems, crowd control problems. And the, the, the church authorities are pretty much, they want people reverent, quiet, obedient, and not rushing around because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it could even be a safety issue. Right. Wow. Well, this has been so helpful and uh, really fun to, to both read the book and to talk with you today. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for sharing with us and for all the scholarship and writing that went into this. Uh, I hope that uh, many pastors and worship leaders and worshipers will pick the book up and learn from it. Thank you so much. Thank you.